in brief, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a status update on uh, sort of what the state of the literature and the thinking is uh, with respect to wind and social acceptance. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of studies that um, I find particularly useful uh, that are relatively recent, not all of them um, just very recent, but uh, that are useful in sort of helping guide us through um, uh, thinking about social acceptance. So I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. This is the four elements of the of the talk this morning. Um, basically, we'll, we'll talk briefly about some introductions. Uh, we'll talk about how thinking has evolved in this space. Uh, we'll go through the research that I was just mentioning a moment ago. And then uh, I'll wrap up with just a, a couple of brief comments on how we might uh, mitigate uh, social acceptance challenges based on uh, what we've seen uh, from the thinking thus far. Uh, so social acceptance is one of those topics that's uh, pretty challenging because it means a lot of different things to different people. Um, within the academic world, uh, it's usually broken down into three specific components. Uh, and those three components are represented here on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, you have socio-political acceptance, uh, which is really the sort of the policy landscape. Uh, you have market acceptance, which is consumers and utilities, um, grid operators, uh, as well as investors. And then you have community acceptance, and that's really what happens on the local level. Uh, folks there are interested in, in fairness and equity, uh, as well as potential nuisance concerns like aesthetics or, or noise. A lot of the focus uh, when you talk about social acceptance tends to be on community acceptance, uh, but I would make the case actually that all three of these elements are actually quite important, um, and we shouldn't necessarily focus exclusively on, on community acceptance, uh, because as you'll see a bit later on, uh, what's happening at the socio-political level and at the market level uh, influence even what people think at the community level. Um, obviously, in that regard, personal convictions, um, and, and values uh, are going to play as large a role, perhaps, as any of the explicitly stated concerns. Uh, oftentimes, you know, because uh, we focus on things that are regulated, like noise, uh, people might voice a strong concern about noise when, in fact, they have some more underlying uh, uh, issue or, or challenge associated with wind. Uh, the final thing I'll say with respect to concepts is that wind is a little bit unique in that it's a relatively low energy density technology, uh, meaning we have to have a fair number of, of uh, wind turbines. Uh, and as you, you all know, the machines of today are visible uh, from some distance away. Uh, so that's sort of a, it's a different uh, um, application of the landscape uh, for energy than what we're historically used to with centralized coal and, and nuclear power plant facilities, which have a large impact in their local area, uh, but it's fairly concentrated within that specific area. In terms of the trends, um, in the early days, this is even going back to the 1980s and, and early 1990s, uh, most of the discussion was really about aesthetics. Um, you know, what's happening to the landscape? I don't like how my view is changing. Um, as more and more plants uh, came to be built, and you had a few incidences like Altamont Pass, which those of you that have been around for some time are familiar with the Altamont Pass story, uh, were basically a, a large number of wind turbines were sighted uh, in this pass in California that also happened to be a place where raptors would fly back and forth over the coastal range, uh, resulting in a lot of avian and, and raptor fatalities. Uh, that really sort of piqued the environmental community's interest in sort of understanding the, the, the impact to the avian communities as well as habitat uh, with respect to the ecosystem and environmental impacts. Um, Moving a little bit more recently into the 2000s, when you start to see a lot of wind deployment uh, occurring and you see a lot of new entrants into the space, uh, then people sort of become concerned more about, you know, are, are the developers engaging my community in a way that's fair? Uh, are they being equitable? Or are they just, uh, you know, th this generation's um, uh, land barons coming in and, and taking up my land and then uh, making a lot of money off of it, pulling the money out of my community. Um, so the procedures became a focus within the academic community. There was, there was a look at, at how can uh, we encourage participation, as, as Lisa knows very well. The community wind projects were certainly one uh, way to address this, to have local ownership uh, in projects. Um, probably within the last decade or so, uh, sound and health impacts have really come to the forefront. Um, Concerns about both audible sound as well as infrasound, uh, as well as other health impacts have been raised, um, and that's sort of received some focus uh, within the scientific and, and academic community as well. 
Where, where we come to today, though, I think is actually a, a pretty healthy place uh, for the industry to be and represents to some degree a little bit of a, a maturation. Um, and this is really to focus more on annoyance and, and welfare. Uh, again, this is you know, not unlike what I was actually criticizing on the prior slide. This is sort of a focus at the community level, um, but I'll come back to some of the other elements with respect to sociopolitical and market acceptance too. Uh, for the communities though, I think the focus really is around annoyance and welfare. How can we uh, sort of uh, acknowledge the impacts that wind plants have uh, while balancing that against you know, a, a need to uh, let um, a small, the, the very small minority uh, make the decisions about how uh, we regulate and um, internalize the, the impacts of, of wind plants. Uh, in terms of where the research is headed, I do think a lot of it's really focused on uh, that welfare and quality of life piece, uh, really trying to understand, you know, if we're going to make policy, uh, what is the level of welfare that needs to be maintained and who gets to decide uh, what that is. Um, so we'll shift gears uh, now and, and I'll profile three specific studies. This is a, a somewhat of a, a short, at least in slide count, uh, short talk. Uh, so hopefully we can maybe make up a little bit on some of the time uh, that's been lost so far. Uh, but the first study here was actually um, a really interesting one uh, produced by Health Canada. Uh, they published uh, preliminary draft results uh, publicly uh, last fall. And um, some of you may uh, have seen this study. I'm not aware that they've published their final results yet. Um, I haven't been following the news cycles on this specific piece you know, hourly, but I, I don't think that the final results have come out. Um, so these are still sort of the, the publicly uh, reported results. Uh, if you were to go to the website, which is shown here on the right-hand side, and, and look this up. Um, basically, though, Health Canada uh, wanted to develop some new science-based uh, evidence to uh, inform decision making and policy making uh, for communities uh, considering wind uh, deployment. Uh, they wanted to uh, look at people who lived already next to wind turbines. Uh, and because of some of the challenges with data collection in this domain, they wanted to use different methods uh, in order to, to sort of get a complete picture of uh, what the experience for folks was living next to, to wind turbines. So they looked at self-reported data. They had interviews and, and surveys that they collected. Uh, they wanted to look also more objectively at, at quantitatively measured health outcomes. So what is that? They're looking at sort of long-term blood, blood pressure. Excuse me. They're looking at uh, uh, hair follicle cortisol levels. Um, and then they're doing uh, work with sleep quality. Um, and then the final piece was looking at some empirical sound measurements. So you'll, you can see here on the slide they had over 4,000 hours of uh, wind turbine sound recordings that they, they assessed. Uh, for this particular study, they were looking at sites in both Ontario as well as Prince Edward Island. Uh, you can see there there's about double the number of sites in Ontario as Prince Edward Island. In part, that's a function of uh, the amount of wind turbines installed in, in, in each location. Uh, they had a focus on homes that were relatively proximate within 600 meters of a wind turbine, uh, but they also included, uh, for uh, statistical purposes, a uh, random selection of homes uh, up to 10 kilometers away. Uh, they actually had a participating sample, which I think is, is pretty impressive. Over 1,200 households uh, participated in this survey, and that was about um, not quite 80 percent of uh, the homes that they uh, targeted. In terms of the actual results uh, themselves, I think uh, there's sort of a, a brief summary here. The first three bullets, uh, basically they found that wind turbine sound was not uh, associated uh, with sleep, illness, stress, or quality of life metrics. So basically any of the sort of health-related indicators that they assessed, uh, assessed, neither wind turbine sound or distance actually uh, were correlated with those outcomes in a statistically significant way. Um, they did find, however, that wind turbine uh, sound was correlated with self-reported annoyance. Uh, so uh, as wind turbine sound increased, so did levels of annoyance. Uh, subsequently, they also found that annoyance, so people reporting uh, uh, annoyance from wind turbines, uh, also had elevated uh, blood pressure and cortisol level. Uh, so there was an effect uh, on health resulting from the annoyance, not from wind turbine sound uh, or uh, any of the other sort of related uh, impacts, sound, distance, lights, et cetera. Uh, in terms of the, some of the details, uh, you can see on this slide a little over 15 percent of the sample in Ontario and a little over 5 percent of the sample in Prince Edward Island uh, reported being highly annoyed. 
Um, they did find that annoyance levels increased rather dramatically at levels above 35 dBA. Uh, they found that annoyance actually uh, uh, falls off rather quickly uh, at distances of one to two kilometers, uh, at least for their Ontario sample. Uh, on Prince Edward Island, uh, everyone that was highly annoyed, uh, or, or the vast majority of those reporting to be highly annoyed, were concentrated within uh, 550 meters of uh, turbine. Um, so really, those folks that were, were living uh, quite close to the turbines were those that were most uh, highly annoyed, perhaps not surprisingly, although some literature has found a, 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 the opposite result uh, in that folks that live closer um, tend to be less uh, annoyed, perhaps because of experience. That's the theory, at least. But in this particular case, uh, those that were living very close were the most annoyed. Um, and uh, annoyance levels were much lower if there was a lot of uh, other nighttime noise. So if you had uh, high levels of nighttime noise from any other uh, facility, uh, particularly those that, that uh, were greater than wind turbine noise levels by 10 decibels, uh, then annoyance was much lower there. So there's some masking effect uh, that was observed in this particular study. Uh, a number of other variables were correlated uh, with annoyance. Uh, visual appearance, concern for safety, noise sensitivity, all those uh, resulted in higher levels of annoyance. On the other hand, uh, if you personally benefited from the project, uh, they found a, a substantial reduction in uh, levels of annoyance. This is not a necessarily a new result. It's consistent with uh, what's been observed really actually around the world uh, as it relates to uh, experiences living next to wind turbines. Um, for the empirical sound measurements, um, well, that's really shown on, on this slide. That the first two uh, bullets focus on um, DBA. Uh, levels and then DBC uh, levels. And basically what they found is that by and large uh, the wind plants were um, um, operating at noise levels that are consistent with guidance from organizations like the WHO, uh, the World Health Organization, or other uh, sort of literature-based recommendations for, for noise levels. Uh, they did find uh, uh, peak noise levels uh, of about 46 dBA at, at wind speeds of 8 meters per second. This is slightly above uh, sort of what WHO recommends for nighttime averages of, of 40 dBA, but you know we're comparing an average with a peak level, uh, and then uh, a peak with a nighttime recommended average. So take that for what it is. Um, similarly, on the DBC scale, uh, they found that 3% of homes exceeded uh, 60 uh, decibels on a C weighting scale, uh, and uh, correspondingly, the, the guidance is that nighttime sound levels on the DBC scale should be below 60 to 65 uh, DBC. So, you know, a few uh, cases uh, where they're above sort of the recommended norms, but by and large, uh, for these particular facilities, they found plants operating uh, at or below the recommended norms. Uh, they basically found the same results uh, on the DBA and DBC scale in terms of annoyance, so it didn't really matter uh, if you looked at sound with these two different weightings. Um, and I, I should point out, apologies here, DBA is a weighting of sound that is more attuned to the human ear. Uh, so this uh, weights sound uh, so that um, it's more, um, uh, it's more. Uh, how do I want to say, it, your ear picks, these are the sounds that your ear picks up. Uh, on the DBC side, these are somewhat lower frequency uh, uh, this is a lower frequency weighting. Uh, it's not necessarily weighting the infrasound levels uh, below 10 or 20 hertz, uh, but it is a lower frequency uh, weighting. Uh, with respect to infrasound specifically, they did measure infrasound from turbines up to 10 kilometers away uh, with a decay rate of uh, 3 decibels for every doubling of the distance uh, once you get outside of 1 kilometer. You talk to the acoustical engineers, this is a pretty typical result uh, that you would expect to find uh, from wind turbines. And for infrasound, uh, it was generally below the audible level, uh, but it was sort of approaching the threshold of audibility uh, for those persons that have you know, the very most sensitive uh, hearing. So basically, your 99th percentile or above. Um, they might occasionally hear uh, infrasound from, from wind turbines. So the conclusion of this study is that, um, you know, basically uh, wind turbine sound uh, is, is not correlated with any sort of long-term health impact, um, but it is a contributor to annoyance. And if you're annoyed a large amount of the time, uh, if it's because of wind turbines or if it's because of wind turbines in any number of things, uh, then you're going to have uh, elevated blood pressure higher cortisol levels, and things that are not necessarily good for your long-term health. Uh, the key distinction, though, is that it's not actually the sound or the distance from the turbine that's resulting in this. It's actually the annoyance or sort of the psychological state uh, that, um, 
is uh, resulting in the, the health effect. So have you studied people taking yoga? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that should be part of my mitigation measures. I'll get to that uh, here at the end. Yeah, I recommend uh, free yoga classes for those living next to wind turbines. Um, uh, so the, the next study here, uh, and I'll move through these a little bit more quickly. Um, this is one that actually got quite a lot of press when it was released. It came out in 2013. It was from a set of Australian researchers. Um, and I think part of the press really focused on the, the obviously the most sensationalist uh, piece, uh, which I don't necessarily think is the most constructive conclusion to come from the work. Uh, but before I get to that, um, this was uh, looking at the relationship between health complaints um, and and wind turbines, and they sort of posited a theory uh, that this was a result of what they call the nocebo expectations hypothesis. So a nocebo, uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the term, is sort of the opposite of a placebo. A placebo is an inert substance that has positive impacts, and nocebo is an inert substance that has negative impacts. And the idea here is that if you expect something bad to happen, then you start to associate, uh, uh, you know, things that are bad in your life with that thing. Or you might even start to experience symptoms uh, as a result of those expectations. You might, not, you might even actually have physiological symptoms, um, but it's a function of your expectations rather than any uh, sort of pathology or physiological link. Uh, they, they actually highlight a number of uh, aspects uh, with respect to both wind turbines as well as research in other fields uh, to both demonstrate the viability of this hypothesis and then how it relates to wind. A couple of the things are highlighted here. I won't go through each of them, but just a few to, to call out. You know, audible sound levels from wind turbines typically fall within the regulated norms. There's nothing necessarily uh, highly unique about wind turbine sound. There's been no demonstrated physiological uh, uh, um, explanation for how the symptoms that are reported might result from sound. Uh, you know, with respect to infrasound, there's large amounts of both uh, man-made and natural infra infrasound in the environment. There's no reason to think infrasound from wind turbines would be any different. Uh, they also looked at um, correlations between when people uh, reported symptoms and the news cycles. So if there was a lot of news coverage around um, you know, what might happen with a wind facility, and then all of a sudden they started to get a peak in, in sort of the reports of, of symptoms. Uh, this was observed in the Australian context. And then finally, you know, the, the symptoms that are reported really are more consistent with uh, stress and anxiety. So this goes back to sort of the annoyance, the cortisol levels, the, the elevated blood pressure that was highlighted in the Canadian study. Those are symptoms that are, are, are not unique to uh, sound or other things that you might actually be able to regulate from a, from a wind turbine. Um, so the, 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 the sort of the popular press took from this that, you know, okay, well, we should just disregard all these complaints because uh, it's just a nocebo. These people are all upset about, you know, their expectations, uh, not actually anything that's substantive or, or real. Uh, although the authors took a, a slightly more nuanced conclusion, and, and it's one that I think is particularly constructive for this context. Uh, that is that, you know, if we want to address social acceptance problems, uh, we have to create more positive narratives for wind. We have to uh, change people's expectations about uh, what it's like to live next to a wind turbine, and then you might see an improvement of social acceptance, at least for those folks uh, that are concerned about these types of, of issues and maybe have uh, fear, fear or, or otherwise negative uh, expectations about wind. The last study here is actually, it's getting a, a little bit dated, but I think it's, it's unique, and I think it's actually uh, pretty, uh, pretty powerful in terms of the message that it has to share. Um, this author is, uh, he's actually, he, he's Welsh, um, and so he's familiar with the UK context. And what, what he sort of posits in this particular paper is that the people don't tend to oppose wind projects uh, because they don't understand them, or they don't know about the benefits, or they don't, you know, understand the value of wind uh, as, as an, a, um, a technology to mitigate climate change. Uh, it really has to do more with sort of their, their deeper sort of core values or their worldview, um, as well as their understanding and their philosophy about how uh, decisions for their community should be made. 
Uh, so the second sort of sub-bullet here highlights a number of, of patterns that he sees and has pulled from the UK context uh, that have emerged from the discussions um, of wind projects that have had trouble uh, moving forward. Um, and you can see, you know, a number of these themes are not uncommon uh, for places that have problems in the U.S. You know, what's the proper use and relationship to landscapes? Uh, who's, whose right is it uh, to control the land area that, where I live? Uh, who's, who's actually the right peer person not only to control but to make decisions about this particular area? Uh, can I trust? Uh, these outsiders that are coming in and developing these projects, uh, can I trust these outside businesses who, who are unlikely to act in my interest? Um, you know, should my community be responsible for uh, emissions in China or other parts of the developing world? Um, and then how, what's, you know, what's really the relationship between lay and, and expert knowledge? Again, going, going back to this, who, who makes decisions and how do we get our information? Um, and what he really emphasizes is that uh, you, you need to bring sort of some understanding of uh, the worldviews and the values of the community you want to develop in uh, to the table from the very beginning. In fact, you should identify those things uh, right up front uh, before you even really start to make any sort of significant investment uh, in a particular community and sort of focus on those communities that have a worldview perhaps that better aligns uh, with uh, being more receptive to wind power. You know, there's, there's no reason uh, necessarily, particularly in the U.S. where we have a vast amount of wind resource and, and land area uh, where we can place wind projects, that we should sort of be focusing on those issues, on those locations that are most easily inflamed. Um, and, and even though, you know, if you take that strategic sort of upfront approach, that doesn't mean you'll uh, have no issues in developing a project, uh, but it does mean uh, in the end, though, uh, as well, that you're not likely to resolve some of these differences. It's not as if you're going to be able to convince or persuade uh, someone that has a worldview that says we don't need wind projects in this area uh, that, that you do need a wind project in, in that particular area. Uh, and when you sort of get to that point where it's not really a matter of persuasion, uh, you, it's actually kind of um, helpful, I think, because you focus on, well, okay, how do we resolve this? Um, it's really a, a sort of a, an emphasis, as it says on the slide here, on settlement uh, rather than convincing someone that, th someone that this is the right thing to do. It's sort of how can we coexist uh, within this specific, specific context. Uh, so the last slide here um, really is uh, just a few bullets that I've extracted um, um, from uh, evaluation of the literature as well as uh, working in this space for, for a number of years. I, I, I'm not sure if uh, Lisa mentioned this in the bio, but a lot of my experience actually comes from work through a working group of the international agency where we have international uh, researchers who are focused on social acceptance meet on an on a annual or, or biannual basis um, and come together and, and sort of discuss the, the themes and experiences uh, from the different countries. Uh, so these mitigation measures are both pulled from the literature as well as my own experience and then these conversations with this International Energy Agency Working Group. Um, but, you know, to some degree, to, to reiterate here a little bit, you really do want to focus on all aspects of social acceptance, market, community, and uh, uh, socio-political acceptance. You want to build sort of a broad coalition of support uh, for the wind industry across each of those areas uh, to try and uh, build as much momentum uh, around wind development as, as is possible. I think we also need to, sort of going back to that maturation uh, point, recognize that, you know, wind projects are large infrastructure. Uh, this is, and, and this is not unlike, you know, building a new road through a rural area or building, um, you know, a new office building or, or something like that. This is a big change uh, that people uh, sort of have to wrap their head around. And with any change, there's going to be winners and losers. Uh, so we need to try and, and um, you know, uh, mitigate the impacts to the losers or compensate them for their welfare loss in some form or, or another. Obviously, determining what level to do so and who gets compensation and who doesn't is a, a non-trivial challenge, uh, but it's something that we do need to be thinking about, uh, trying to balance that, that welfare uh, impact. Obviously, to the, to the last article I profiled here, we do want to get to know the communities uh, where wind projects are being considered up front. Uh, obviously, this is probably more direct guidance to the development community than, than this particular group, uh, but many of you probably interact with developers on a semi-regular basis, and making sure that they're making strategic decisions about where they focus, not just from the respect of, of uh, what's the wind resource and can I get 
connected to the transmission line, uh, but is this going to be a, a project that's going to inflame sort of social concern, uh, or is it going to be one where it's going to be well received? Um, in addition, uh, also sort of consistent with this theme of maturation, I think it's okay for developers and for the community to recognize that sometimes we need to bring in uh, experts. Um, there are people who specialize in sort of managing uh, uh, the development of infrastructure projects uh, so that it, it goes along in a, in a smooth way. Um, sort of classically, this would be your PR firm. Uh, it doesn't have to be a PR firm. It could be actually a local champion or otherwise. Uh, but some sort of intermediary can sometimes be a really uh, crucial a way to bridge the gap between sort of these outsider who is coming in and developing and the local community members who want to protect uh, and don't want to be taken advantage of. Uh, finally, um, obviously, uh, you do want to engage folks earlier rather than better. I think surprises are generally bad for humanity uh, as a whole. Uh, no one really likes to be surprised uh, unless it's your birthday or something like this, I suppose. But, but generally, particularly with large infrastructure projects, people don't like to be surprised about that kind of thing. Uh, but you know, even within that, we need to recognize that not everyone is going to agree uh, that a wind project in this particular location is a good idea. Um, but I think you can move beyond that by focusing on how we settle our differences and coexist uh, rather than is this a good or bad thing philosophically. So with Yes, there has been some uh, a look at that. Unfortunately, um, it's been a little bit of a challenge because the wind industry is relatively young. Uh, um, and the work that's been done to date actually has, to some degree, some conflicting results. Uh, there's certainly been, if you're familiar with Ben Hohen's work on property values, uh, you know, he has found that, that um, to the extent that a property impact uh, can be identified. Again, none of his results have had statistically significant impacts, but to the extent that you can see, you know, some movement in the noise, uh, you know, that there's a possibility for a, a, an increase in property values shortly after a project is, a, or sorry, a decrease in property values uh, shortly after the project uh, is announced, and then it sort of bottoms out during construction, and then returns to more normal levels uh, with time uh, in the years following when people are able to experience uh, living next to a wind turbine and realize, you know, that their their expectations, I guess, are actually reset. Uh, so it kind of goes back to that nocebo um, uh, paper uh, whereby, you know, people's expectations maybe aren't materialized and so they can have a, a more normal coexistence with the plant. Uh, that hasn't, though, necessarily been found in, in all cases. Um, it's not clear, though, if that's really a data issue or, uh, you know, that we don't have large enough samples uh, or if there's actually different results. Uh, from the different studies. In some cases, uh, you know, you've found uh, generally consistent levels of, of support or opposition throughout. Um, I'm not sure that people have found that it gets worse with time, uh, but it's just not clear that it gets better with time. I don't know that that specific sort of land ownership value or issue has, has been raised really frequently in the literature, but I think it goes back to this uh, sort of more general conclusion that any project you're creating is going to have winners and losers. And we need to think sort of before the fact about uh, who those groups are likely to be and how we can mitigate the concerns of the losers. I mean, I think this, this, you know, this is just sort of a general planning and policy uh, sort of theme that, that any change from the status quo creates winners and losers. And if you want to enact change, um, you know, you're better off trying to make the losers your friends in some form or another uh, rather than, you know, not thinking about them at all. And in that particular case, you know, perhaps it would have behooved the developer to, to think more about, um, you know, investments in the community rather than just the lease payments. So you certainly see, um, you know, investments, uh, property tax payments, which do have a more general um, uh, community base. Um, but you've even seen developers make big investments in, in local schools. Uh, and, you know, building a new fire station uh, and setting up a fund that, you know, maybe pays for energy efficiency investments. I um, mean, I think, yeah, we need to be a little bit more creative. Those are certainly not universal practices. Uh, some of them uh, tend to be more common in Europe than in the U.S. Um, but I think those are the types of things that we have to think about going forward, um, independent of whether it shows up in an academic paper or not. So actually, the, the Danes have instituted a, at the national level, and uh, granted, Denmark's a much smaller country than, than uh, many even U.S. states, uh, 
Um, but what they've instituted at the national level is a uh, property value reimbursement scheme. So if you can demonstrate, and, and they have you know, pretty straightforward rules for demonstrating a, a property value impact, um, they will compensate you for that loss. Um, and this is you know, the very same kind of, of policy uh, that, I, that I think you're mentioning. Um, you know, you've seen other locations, uh, perhaps probably more at the local level, that have considered sort of property value guarantees um, as well. Um, you know, the, obviously the evidence is that there's no sort of uh, general uh, property value impact when you sort of look at the industry as a whole. Um, you know, there may be outliers uh, to that. Uh, so so the, the policy is not, certainly not unique. Uh, as with any policy measure, though, the devil's always in the details. And so I, I'm not familiar with that specific proposal, but suffice it to say that the concept is, is certainly not unique and is something that, that in the, certainly in the more mature uh, markets, um, like, the, like Denmark, has actually been institutionalized on a national basis. No, there's certainly differences, and this goes back to, to actually John's first question uh, with respect to the temporal aspect. Uh, the, the, the best projects for which we have sort of a long temporal history use much different technology. Uh, they're using smaller machines. They're using uh, the machines that were designed with, for example, noise as much more of a secondary consideration. They might be, they're, they're actually pitch controlled machines, or stall controlled machines, I'm sorry, rather than what we have, um, all the modern machines today are, are pitch controlled. So, uh, you know, when the wind would get too high, essentially the, the you'd have an, an aerodynamic brake almost, you know, to some degree like a, like an airplane uh, flap. This is, this is maybe going a little bit too far, but essentially you would have a, a stall controlled machine such that um, when you got to a certain noise level, uh, the, the noise, or sorry, a not certain wind speed level, the noise would become very loud because of the aerodynamics and the change in the aerodynamics that would keep this, the machine from overspinning, uh, overspeeding and, and tearing itself apart. Uh, so that's a real challenge actually in this space and, and it's not necessarily one that we can do anything about because it's really more just a function of a, a relatively new industry. Uh, so having some of those long temporal uh, relationships with sort of state of the art technology are, are always a challenge. Um, you know, I, some of you may have heard about the foul mouth project in, in uh, um, Massachusetts or, or some of the, the projects in, um, on Cape Cod. Uh, those, this was actually a very controversial uh, two-turbine installation on, on Cape Cod uh, that, um, you know, they had shut down for extended periods of time. Um, but it, they, they were old and they were stall-controlled machines. And, yeah, if you're sitting close to, to people, um, you probably want to be going with some of the newer state-of-the-art designs uh, that do, um, you know, you've seen a lot of progress from the OEMs in trying to, um, you know, ad adopt blade technologies that have uh, uh, at least, um, you know, much higher energy production uh, for a given level of noise uh, relative to some of the older technologies. So certainly a change there. So offshore is... Um, uh, certainly an opportunity that we have in the U.S. Uh, it was part of the wind vision. Rich didn't uh, delve into it in great detail, but it's certainly part of the discussion there. Um, one of the primary justifications for going offshore is a reduction in, in the social uh, impacts uh, of the technology, both from an aesthetic perspective as well as a, a noise perspective. Um, you know, there is some obviously thought about wildlife habitat, although then you, you know, then you sort of, um, you know, you start to, to uh, if you talk to marine uh, environmentalists, um, they may not feel necessarily the same way that we would feel in the interior of the country, uh, thinking that there's a lower environmental impact. I think the, the envir there is certainly a possibility for lower environmental impacts depending on the site offshore, uh, but it really does depend on those site-specific conditions. From a social acceptance perspective, yeah, certainly moving the turbines further offshore uh, can help uh, social acceptance. It also makes uh, what is currently a relatively expensive technology, even more expensive. So, you know, every time, for every kilometer or mile that you go offshore, that's additional distance that you have to travel uh, to construct the machine. It's additional uh, cable that you have to have to get the power to, uh, to, um, uh, to the shore. Uh, it's additional distance that you have to travel when you're going to service the machines. Uh, so there's certainly a possibility or an opportunity there um, but if we really want to 
you know, use that as a means to solve social acceptance challenges, uh, there's an incremental cost that's probably going to be incurred. Um, and offshore wind is not necessarily in a place right now where it's uh, able to incur a lot of additional incremental costs. Um, really, I think the, the offshore wind community is focused um, on cost reduction pretty heavily right now uh, to increase the viability of their projects. Uh, so maybe not necessarily a short-term or near-term opportunity, but perhaps more in the long-term that could be a strategy uh, to adopt.